Here's what happened to me this week. I was scheduled to teach Romans this week, and actually it was an iffy of whether or not I was going to teach Romans or this other class. Um, but uh, a dear friend of mine growing up, uh, Kevin Parker, uh, came to me and said, hey, if you've got just 15 minutes, I'd love your take on a passage of Scripture. Now, Kevin's one of the lawyers that works with me at work, and, and uh, he and I have known each other and been dear friends since middle school, going back a long, long, long time ago. I had the pleasure of baptizing Kevin when we were in college together, and he's a dear, dear soul. So Kevin said uh, he's leading a Bible study in Romans, and, and there is an issue that had come to light, if we can go to the Elmo, on Romans chapter 2, verses... He said 6 through 10, but really the issue starts with 5 through 10. So yeah, we'll use Stephen's Bible for a moment. Isn't it interesting? My dear brother Steve doesn't seem to have read this before in his Bible. No, no marks. Anyway, let me write uh, very important right here. Um, (laughs) It reads and says... Because of your hard and impenitent heart, you're storing up wrath for yourself. On the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed, God will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor, And immortality, he will give eternal life. Look at that. He will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience in well-doing, he'll give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking, those who do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress. For every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. And so Kevin said to me, that seems to be inconsistent. That seems to be, if we go back to the PowerPoint please, seems to be inconsistent with the message of the Bible. Seems to be inconsistent with the message of Romans. Seems to be inconsistent if he had heard with Pastor David's sermon this morning. Seems to be inconsistent with Ephesians 2. For by grace you've been saved by work, uh, by faith, not by works, lest any man should boast. He said, what's going on here? I said, man, that's a great, great question. And it's a hallmark question for us to take time out and as we look at Romans, use this opportunity to reinforce good study habits. And that's what I want to do with you today. So I start by telling you Christmas is around the corner. It's never too soon to buy a book. If you don't own this book, buy this book. It is a marvelous book, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth, by Gordon Fee, New Testament scholar, Paul specialist, wrote uh, one of the best commentaries on 1 Corinthians that's out there. Gordon Fee is a masterful scholar who has written a masterful work with one of the sorriest titles I've ever seen in my life. I find the title reprehensible. No one will ever, in a book a fourth of an inch thick or a half inch thick, teach you to read the Bible for all the Bible's worth. For that matter, in your life, you'll never read the Bible for all the Bible's worth. I suspect Professor Fee did not come up with the title, and the title has stuck through, I think, the third edition right now. But it's a great book to read. It's a wonderful book, so get it and then read it. Don't merely get it and put it on your shelf. Get this book. Have your family read it. Have anybody who's interested in Bible study read this book. It's a masterful way 
to explain to study the Bible. Because you read different parts of the Bible differently. We should be studying Paul's letters and the other letters in the New Testament differently, for example, than we might study the book of Acts or we might study the Gospels. Or then we might study parts of the Old Testament. So, we've got that, and I want to tell you what it says about reading an epistle. Reading, get rid of that. The key to reading an epistle is context. You need to put the epistle into context. Kevin should never simply say, this passage seems troublesome to me. Because before that passage should seem troublesome, there are some things that need to be done. The first thing you do when you're putting it into context is you want to put it into the context of the letter itself. What do we know about the city to whom uh, 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 the recipients of the letter? What do we know about the people who, who were the Christians there? The people that are getting the letter, where they're located, all of those types of things, where Paul may have been when he wrote it, why the letter was written. Any details we can get to put the letter into context is extremely helpful. After we put the letter into context, we need to read the entire letter. Saying, well, it's going to take a while. Eh, it's not going to take that long. And it's the Bible. I mean, you get like brownie points for reading it. When you read it, take some paper. And take a pen and make some notes. Just sort of jot down the flow of thought that seems to be going. If you see some words and phrases, I may tease Steve a little bit, but for all my teasing on the other side of his page, look at what he's done here. He's taken and he's underlined the word natural, nature, natural. See, take those words. Those are key words in Paul's writings. And when you see those key words or words that are repeated over and over, or phrases that are repeated over and over, jot them down. Make notes. Try to capture the flow of what you're reading, the logical flow. It's one of the reasons we were on 2 Corinthians last week. Scholars say 2 Corinthians is choppy, and it is choppy. And if you read it, it reads choppy. If you're trying to follow the flow, you think, that's kind of choppy. It's choppy, which helps us understand that it's a letter that Paul wrote over a period of time while he was on the road. So, you read it, you read the entire letter through one time, making notes and phrases, then you can break it apart and start studying the paragraphs, because then the paragraphs make sense of the big whole. You with me? Make sense? So that's when you study the paragraphs. I would suggest to you, after you study the paragraphs, you can then start studying the verses. And you can take the words apart, but you don't even want to take a verse out of context. I had a chance to talk to someone last week, and I told them, I said, you take verses out of context, you're in trouble. There is a verse in the Bible that says, God does not hear the prayers of sinners. And if you just quote that, it sounds horrible. We're all in trouble. But if you read it in context, you see that this is what some uneducated Jewish fellow who'd just been healed was saying when he's getting cross-examined by the Jewish power structure. Doesn't mean it's what it's. The, it, you've got to put it into context. You take some of what Job's friends were saying to Job, uh, and just read them as a verse, and you get some really mixed-up theology. So you study the verses after the paragraphs after you've read the letter. Make sense? Then, in my opinion, and only then, do you consult the commentaries. See what the experts have to say. See what other people are writing about. Now, that doesn't mean you can't do that earlier, but sometime do it this way and be amazed as you do this. And, and in my PowerPoint, I failed to put down one of the most important words that should accompany each step along the way. Do this prayerfully, praying that God will enlighten you, praying for His Spirit to, to quicken your heart. And you'll find some amazing things when you do. 
Then when you get to the commentaries, and the commentaries take a verse like and a passage like Kevin was concerned about, and they give you three or four different alternatives of what different scholars might think it means, you're already in a position to say, you know, I, this was already making sense to me this way. I think these other scholars on these other opinions may not have taken it in context. Maybe you don't. But that's the way you do it. Now, that's what I want us to do with Romans. Don't worry. We are not going down through step five today. I figure today we're good for step one. We're not going to read the entire letter, but I am going to paraphrase it, step two. And then step three, we'll go back and look at Kevin's paragraphs. So let's get moving on this. First, the context of the letter. Now, we already know some of this. We've already put up our map. We've been studying the New Testament together through our survey class. We know about this back and forth we had with Paul and when he was at Ephesus with Corinth. We can throw Rome up on the map and show where it is. And it helps us to understand that while Paul is in the Aegean Sea area, there's a ready exit from Corinth over to Rome. Rome is not out of the way. I can tell you if you can see the little uh, laser red dot. If you go from Corinth to the heel of the boot of Italy, at the heel of the boot is the Appian Way's ending point. That's the main road that goes into Rome. So you could just get over to the heel of the boot and go to Rome on the road, or you could sail around and go to Rome that way. Multiple ways to Rome. But it was a standard place, and the entry point for much of the Greek world was Corinth from Rome. So you got mail going back and forth, or at least travelers going back and forth, on a fairly steady basis, at least during the months that are not winter, when it's tough to sail even that short a stretch. So we can plug in that, and that gives us a little bit of geographical information. We know the location. And we know Rome was the capital city. We know it's the most populated city at the time. Now we can also plug in the biblical timeline. We can, and, and I'll, I'll give you more detail on this later. David referenced this this morning in his sermon. I've got it in our outline as well. The church most likely started at Pentecost. And we think that because of Acts 2.10. Luke, when he's giving the history of the church starting in Acts chapter 2, before Peter preaches to everyone and they all become believers, it starts out with them speaking in tongues. And people are amazed and astonished. And they're saying, hey, aren't all these guys Galileans? How is it we each hear in our own native language? The Parthians, the Medes, the Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia... Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya belong to Serene. Even visitors from Rome. So among those who 3,000 were added that day, among the Christians included some from Rome. And if they are converted at that time and they return to Rome, they begin worshiping the Lord Jesus, their Messiah. So that's the start of the church. Now David also talked this morning about the Jewish expulsion. The reference to that is in Acts 18 verse 2. That there was a time of where the Jews were sent out from Rome. Paul uh, uh, has this affect him directly in Acts 18. After this, Paul left Athens. He went to Corinth. He found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius, Claudius was the emperor, the Roman emperor, had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And that's the reference to what David was referencing today. So all of the Jews are expelled from Rome. And yet, we know by the time Paul's writing this letter, by the way, Claudius who evicted him, died in 54 A.D., October 54 A.D. We can pinpoint that. So by the time Paul's writing this, Paul is in Corinth, which has got that connection through Priscilla and Aquila to Rome, and clearly other Roman connections as well. So Paul is in Corinth. 
He's writing the letter to Rome from Corinth. Priscilla and Aquila have gone back to Rome because Paul greets them in the letter. So all of this goes into context in the biblical timeline, and it allows us to look at it and to see and to make a little bit more sense of it with our map. Now, we can go beyond that, and we can get some cool stuff. I mean, there's location, geography, there's the biblical timeline, but you can look outside the Bible for cool stuff. Another good reference tool for people is Zondervan's Pictorial Bible Dictionary. You can look up Rome, and you can find in there uh, pictures and statements, and it'll tell you about Rome, and it'll tell you how big it was, and it'll give you details about it, and it really helps. You can go to our class website and pull our lessons off of this stuff. You can pull the lesson you've got right now. I try to give you detailed background information on Rome. Here's some more cool stuff. Suetonius. Let's say you think, hey, that's really interesting about the Jews leaving, but I'd like to know more. Secular history. The Bible is not at odds with secular history. The Bible and secular history are one congruent whole. Because the Bible is history of the world, it's just history told with God's perspective, okay? But, I mean, if, if we had the Bible being written today, which we don't, okay? But if we did, 2,000 years from now, you wouldn't have to worry that God's Bible had said today that, that Mark Wilkie was president of the United States of America when secular history would say it was Barack Obama. They, they, they match up. So when Acts says that Claudius evicted the Jews, we can read about it in secular history. Suetonius was the guy in charge of the Roman records. And a couple of decades later, he's writing the lives of the Caesars. And in it, you can read what he says about Claudius. Here it is. I've given you the citation in your, in your uh, lesson. It says, um, since the Jews constantly made disturbances at the instigation of Crestus, he expelled them from Rome. It's only one sentence, but it's in there. And you can read it in Latin. And I don't know if I'm wasting everybody's time. Did anybody in here take any Latin other than me? Oh, yeah, man. Get a load of this. Okay. <laughs> Remember our Latin class. Verbs at the end of the sentence. So you always start there. Expulit. He expelled. Eudios. Impulse cresto. Assidue tumultuantis. Roma expulit. <laughs> this says Cresto. Now, what does that look like to you? Christ. You can see the footnote down at the bottom, put by Professor Rolf. He says this is another form of Christus. And he sends you to Tertullian. He says it's uncertain whether Suetonius is referring to the beginning of the Christian cult in Rome or to some Jew of that name. Well, actually, it's not that difficult to figure out, Professor Wolf, with all due respect, if you know your Hebrew as well as your Latin. Because Crestus is not a Jewish name. Neither is Christus. Christus is off of the Greek name. For anointed. The Hebrew for anointed is in English Messiah Mashiach in Hebrew Yeshua HaMashiach Jesus the Messiah. Alright, so 
with all due respect to the now long dead, Professor Rolf, Crestus is not a Jewish name. Now, Crestus has the idea of kindness in the Greek and Latin, but again, it's, it's still not a Jewish name. There's not a Jewish name there. There is a title that the Greek speakers would use for the Messiah, Christos. So we can take that further. We can see Christos in the writings of, Tur of Tacitus. Tacitus, let's add him to our little thing. Tacitus was a Roman historian. Tacitus wrote shortly thereafter a following passage that I've clearly marked before where he talks about Nero. And he says, Nero, this is after Nero, <laughs> Nero, bless his heart, Rome burns tremendously and it burns all of the houses. And it just happens to, I have something for you. It just happens to burn the houses exactly where Nero's planning on building his new palace. Kismet. And the crowd seems to think Nero did it on purpose. So Nero's doing the blame game and he wants to blame someone else. Nero substituted as culprits and punished with the utmost refinements of cruelty. Now Nero is the emperor right after Claudius. Claudius dies in 54 AD. Nero becomes emperor. Nero, by the way, is the emperor under whom Peter's martyred, Paul is martyred. Punished with the utmost refinements of cruelty, a class of men loathed for their vices, whom the crowd styled Christians. Christus, the founder of the name, had undergone the death penalty in the reign of Tiberius by sentence of the procurator Pontius Pilate. And the pernicious superstition was checked for a moment, only to break out once more, not merely in Judea, the home of the disease, but in the capital itself, where all things horrible or shameful in the world collect and find a vogue. And he goes on to talk about how they would arrest members of the same. By the way, do you know what the terrible vices were? Chief among them, I'll call, it, call you straight away, you Christians, you bunch of cannibals, get together once a week and eat the flesh and drink the blood of some human being, thinking it's partaking in God. That's terrible! Because the Christians had closed communion. The only people invited were Christians. It was not open to the world. And so the, the gossip tree out there for the Lord's Supper, where you partake of the body and blood of Jesus, they thought there was some real person in there getting killed. And, and everybody's doing cannibal stuff. And then they wouldn't worship the gods of Caesar, and so they were claimed to be atheists. The Christians are atheists. Because they won't worship the gods. Well, they may have one, but not the, the whole set. So if you see there, you see it Christus, not Crestus, by, Tertull by uh, uh, Tacitus. Now we're going to go to a Christian lawyer, because the lawyer will always set the record straight. His name is Tertullian. So Tertullian is writing a little bit later in North Africa. And here's what Tertullian says. What charge can lie against words unless the pronunciation of some name has a barbarous sound about it? You know, if someone's named something lewd. Christian, so far as translation goes, is derived from anointing. Lawyer had that right. Yes, and when it's mispronounced by you as Christian, which is the mispronunciation that you find in Suetonius, where he says Crestus. It's just a different ending at the end, but it's that est sound instead of the I sound. For you have not even knowledge of the mere name. It's framed from sweetness or kindness. Crestus is. So you, you can read through this kind of stuff and you can see quickly and readily that what Luke reported is reported also by the secular people. There was a time where the Jews were kicked out because they were fighting over Christ. Christ had caused division within the Jews themselves. 
And so Claudius, he just kicks out all the Jews. He doesn't say, okay, let me figure out who's right and who's wrong among you Jews. He just kicks them all out. And so the Jews leave. Now what's the bottom line? There it is. <laughs> That's a joke. Okay. What's the bottom line? Well, this is what David was alluding to in church, but let's, let's, put, it, let's put it on the Elmo. Put this two and two together. See what you come up with. All right, we got Elmo. Elmo, and there is Elmo. Let me zoom out. Okay, here's the bottom line. So you have the church starts with Jews from Pentecost. Right? Now, you start with Jews. Gentiles come in. Mix in some Gentiles. Looks like a recipe. When you start with some Jews, mix in a few Gentiles, bake at 350. Um, mix in a few Gentiles. Then, who's in control of this church? The Jews who started, of course. It's meeting in houses. Who's home? The Jews. Who's in charge of the budget? The Jews. Who's the preacher? The Jews. Who's teaching Sunday school? The Jews. Who's in charge of uh, the treasury? The Jews. So you got a church with Jews, and you got a church with Gentiles. And the Jews are doing all of the good works. And then all of a sudden, the Jews are gone. Boom! Now who's in charge of the preaching? Gentiles. Now whose house has the meetings? Gentiles. Now who's in charge of the budget and the treasury? Gentiles. Now who are the elders and deacons? Gentiles. And then the Jews come back. Hey guys, y'all did real good babysitting while we were gone. But the adults are home. And the babysitter can go back to playing. And this is the predicament that the church was in when Paul writes this letter. If we fail to see this predicament, we're going to lose a lot of import of what Paul's saying. So this is the context this gives us that context, and now we can read the entire letter. I have 21 minutes left. I would like to go through this entire letter, 16 chapters, in 16 of those minutes. Fasten your seat belt. Are you ready? All right, letter starts out with Paul giving his greetings. And so it's got this section that I just call the introduction and the theme. And it's for about the first 17 verses of the first chapter. Paul begins by identifying himself as a servant of Christ. Now that may mean something to us, but it would mean a lot to the Jews because there's an Old Testament phrase, Eved Adonai. Eved means servant, Adonai means God. Paul has taken that phrase, using it in a Greek form, but substituted for the Lord Christ. Because Paul is not a servant of the Lord, a servant of God. Yes, he is, but he's using directly the Lord God that he serves. He's a servant of Christ, and that's the same thing for Paul. So it's a strong message that's going to immediately register among the Jews that are hearing this message, or even the Greeks that are familiar with Old Testament Scripture. So Paul begins and he says he's a servant of Christ. That means he's writing, when you're a servant of God in the Old Testament, when you're an Evid Adonai, it doesn't mean simply that you're carrying water for the Lord. It means that you have authority from the Lord. It means you're His messenger. It means you're His, you are His expression on earth. You are what God is doing on earth. And that's what Paul's saying. He's saying, hey, I'm Christ's emissary to you. I'm speaking to you with the authority of Jesus Christ. And I'm speaking to you about the gospel. And this is 16 and 17. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. There is no shame associated at all with the gospel. Now remember, the gospel for Paul 
is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Don't confuse it with our gospel books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which tell about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. For Paul, gospel means the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus on our behalf. That's the great news, the good news, the euangelion, the gospel. All right? So, that, Paul says, is the power to save, but it's the power to save everyone, Jew or Gentile. You got your different groups? You're both saved by the gospel of Jesus. And he says, this is why Habakkuk says that the righteous will live by faith. This is what it is. This is the salvation that comes. So that's the introduction and theme. Then Paul segues into a section that I call the reign of sin and condemnation. Because here's the bottom line. Over the next few ch verses, Paul's going to say, chapter plus, Paul's going to say, hey, Gentiles, you're going to hell. You worshipped the creation instead of the creator. God gave you over to unnatural desires because you chose nature over the one who is the supernature, who made it. Hey, Jews, don't get arrogant. Because do you know what God's principles of judgment are? If you do right, you go to heaven. If you do wrong, you go to hell. And you know what, Jews? There's not one of you that does right. And that's in your own Old Testament. It's in the Psalms. The Psalms say there's not one who does good. Not one. So you can sit there and look at the road. And you can say, hey, by God's principles, I'm going to go the route of sunshine. I'm not going to sin. But give me a break. Nobody is able to go that way. Can you honestly think you're going right? In that picture. Can you honestly think you're doing that? And he details the sins. Oh, there are some big ones. Yeah, I'm not an adulterer. Yeah, I'm not a homosexual. But how about someone who envies someone else? How about someone who has pride? I mean, the sins are big ones, but the sins are also the ones that that aren't so big. But they are in the eyes of God. Then, then, Paul says in Romans 3, but look, we've got another option. There's another way to go right. There is a righteousness that doesn't come from works of law, but there's one that comes from faith in Jesus. And that is the Romans 3.21. But now a righteousness has been made manifest apart from works of law, even though the Old Testament talks about it. And that's Jesus. And so we've got that now. We've got salvation by the cross. We've got salvation through faith. And it's a marvelous thing. But Jews, you don't get there by righteous works. Gentiles, you don't either. Jews, having the law doesn't get you there. Gentiles, not having the law doesn't get you there. Nobody's going there any other way. But by salvation, by the cross, works. And he says, doesn't this make sense? This is what happened with Abraham. Abraham's faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. And it happened before or after Moses got the law. Huh? Yeah, it better. Abraham has to precede Moses or you don't have all those Jews in Egypt that need to come out. It happens before circumcision. It happens before the sacrifice of Isaac. First time it's announced. In Genesis 15. And so Paul says, that's the way it is with Rome. He goes, I'll take it a step further. How about all those other people in the Old Testament? Moses, David, Solomon, Ruth. Pick any of them. Jeremiah, Elijah. How do they go to heaven? How? By the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Paul says God in his patience overlooked their sin because Paul knows God's not caught by time. And Jesus had to die just for the sins of those that God had already overlooked. 
If, if nobody were ever going to come to faith after the death of Jesus, there was never going to be a believer, Jesus still had to die because God had promised to forgive the sins of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, of Moses, of David, of Solomon, of all of the holy people of the Old Testament. God promised to forgive their sins and the only way to do it is through Jesus. Because it's, 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 it, it, there's a mirroring between what Jesus did and what happened with Adam. Sin came into the world through one man and it spread to everybody who's affiliated with that man. In the same way, sin, I mean righteousness, comes into the world through one man, through Jesus. And it spreads to everybody who's affiliated with that man. That's the way of it. And so that's what he has to say. Now, what does this mean? What are the struggles from this? What are the fruits of this? I think my slide's messed up a little bit. Ignore that little thing in the corner for a moment. Let's work our way there. First of all, some people might say, hey, this is great. Then I can live however I want to. In fact, think about this mathematically. This is probably an engineer who did this, Steve. Think of this mathematically. It may have been a lawyer, too. It may have been an engineer who is a lawyer. Think of this, because it's got a little bit of both of us in it. Think about this one. If the grace of God is such a marvelous thing because it forgives our sins, I can sin even more, and that's making God's grace even more spectacular. I can just sin all I want so that there'll be even more grace. You think God's good now? Wait till you see Him after He forgives this one I'm about to do. And Paul says, meganoito in the Greek. Heavens no, may it never be. This is no license to sin. In fact, it's sin is what drove Jesus to the cross. And sin is what we don't want to do. And there's this constant tug of war and struggle. Because I'm doing the things that I don't want to do. And those things that are good that I want to do, I just have trouble doing them all the time. And I need something, someone, something to save me from this. And I do. That's the but. But there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from this vicious cycle of sin and death and sin and death. And it's a spiral that just goes down the commode. That's the cesspool of sin and what it brings. But I've been set free from it. And I've been set free with the Holy Spirit coming within me. Even when I don't know not only how to do it, but even when I don't know how to pray, the Spirit Himself is interceding for me with groanings too deep for words. And the Spirit is there, and the Spirit is, is, a, is a part of what I am. And the bottom line is, you put all of this stuff together, and, and I am secure in the fact that there's going to be absolutely nothing that's ever going to separate me from the love that Christ has for me. Because it is that, it is, it is, it is the Word of God. Now Paul's a smart fella. And Paul knows as he's saying this that some people are going to say, well, wait a minute. You say that, but what about Israel? God sure seems to have backed away from His promise to them. And you, hopefully you heard some of David's sermon this morning where David dug into this a little bit deeper. But Paul's saying, no, that's not true. First of all, God's promise was never to take care of every person genetically from Abraham. God was always picking, but God's picking was not of, I'm going to save him, I'm going to save him, I'm going to send him to hell, I'm going to send him to hell. God can do whatever God wants to do. But what God did is God elected through Abraham a chosen people who not only had the scripture, but through whom the Messiah would come that would save the faithful. And God's always saved the faithful. He saved them when they're inside of Israel or when they're outside of Israel. And that's the promise that we have with God. So this isn't God's fault if they're not saved. And it's not God's fault if, they're, uh, 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 if, if it looks like God didn't keep His word because His word is still good. So I was speaking at the... Ooh, i got to go fast. I was speaking at the Christian Scholars Conference this summer. And I needed help on my, my panel, Law and Ethics. And uh, um, I had Ken Starr on the panel. I had 
Jeff Boyd from our Supreme Court, good Christian judge here in town or in, 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 in Texas. I had a couple others, and then I ran out of Christian lawyers. So I went. <laughs> it's not true. So I, and I did uh, not run out, but I did ask Rick Meadow, who runs my, my New York office, uh, to join us. And Rick said, Mark, I'm Jewish. How can I be at a Christian Scholars Conference? I said, you'll be right at home. Jesus was Jewish. So was Mary. So was Paul. So was people. We had like tons of Jews. Come on in. The water's fine. In fact, the water's made for you. In fact, the tree is Jewish. I'm grafted on. I'm the Gentile outcast, Paul says, who gets grafted onto the olive tree. But I respect the roots, and I respect the trunk. That's where my Messiah came from. And as David will explain next week, the story's not over. God's not through with the Jews. Come back next week and hear David talk about that. The real bottom line, Paul says, the real bottom line is this. Whoops. Behave. Make your body a living sacrifice. Make that your spiritual worship. Give God who you are. And do it humbly. And do it with your gifts. And by the way, he didn't give you gifts. Jews, you get these. Gentiles, you get those. The gifts are across the board. It's not based upon your ethnicity. So let your love be genuine. Hate what is evil. And pursue what is good and righteous and honorable. Live in authority under the government. Heavens, you're in Rome. You show yourself respectful. This coming from a man who would suffer martyrdom under the Roman emperor within a decade. Don't borrow from each other. You don't want to owe somebody something. What you want to owe them is to love them and show them kindness. So wake up. And show love for each other. Live in peace together, Jew and Gentile. Don't sit there and fuss over the treasury. Don't sit there and fuss over who's in charge. Everybody live by your gifts. Live humbly. Live right before God. And live in unity. And hey, I can't wait to come see you guys. I haven't been to Rome yet. Been trying to get there. Plan to get there. Want to go from there to Spain. I'm excited about the work that God can do. And that, my friends, in 15, 17 minutes, is the book of Romans. Now, you can study the paragraphs from there. And so when you look at a paragraph like Kevin was concerned about, and you, you, you put it within the context of the flow of the whole book, all of a sudden it starts making some better sense. If we go back to the Elmo, here's the passage again that we started class with. Storing up wrath for yourself. On the day when God's righteous judgment will be revealed, He'll render to each one according to His works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory, honor, and immortality, He'll give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and don't obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there'll be wrath and fury, tribulation and distress. Jew first and also the Greek. God shows no partiality. So you want to do right, you do right. Just don't forget... See, here's where it continues. And, and, and I added this for Kevin, but I add this for you. Paul's Greek didn't have these paragraph divisions. Paul's Greek didn't have these verses. Heavens, Paul's Greek didn't have periods. Paul's Greek didn't have spaces between the words. Paper was expensive. They had it down to an art. So it just continues... All who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. Every sinner, Gentile, didn't have the law, every one of you are going to hell if you've sinned. And all who've sinned under the law are going to be judged by the law. So if you've sinned under the law, Jew, you're going to hell. Why on earth do you Jew and Gentiles think that y'all are so different from each other? You're all going to hell. But for the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that's what he works his way to. So all this passage does, it doesn't invalidate Scripture. What this passage does is it validates Scripture. It says that God's law is perfect. It's the point Steve made in his email to me that when Paul says, hey, you know, it's like you died to your spouse so that you're able to marry another one when you 
die to, to, to this world and to the, the law, and you're born again by the Spirit. The law doesn't die. The law is perfect. But we die to the law. We die and we're reborn into Jesus, into the righteousness of Christ, and that's what we've got. So you can now study the paragraphs. Then you can get down into the words after the paragraphs and you can start studying those words. But it's a good way to do it. All right. That's class. Points for home. The gospel is the power of God for salvation of everyone. Salvation to the Jews. Salvation to the Gentiles. Salvation in 54 AD. Salvation in 2013 AD. Salvation in 2013 BC for everyone. It's the power of God to save everyone. There will be no one in heaven saved by the forgiveness that flows from Calvary. There's one way to the Father and it's Jesus. And that's true for all eternity. Thank you, Lord. Point for home two. Now a righteousness from God apart from law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. I've got it up on the screen in the English Standard Version. And I do this just to show you some of the fun of what you can do when you get down into the words. Look at the difference. I promise it's not a typo. Look at the difference in my translation. I mean in the, the way the translators have written the word law. It's up there twice. What's the difference? Second time it's capitalized. Think about why. In the Greek, bless you, in the Greek, you pick this up, and I've explained it in the lesson. It's an anarthrous construction, no article. It's, it's, um, there's, there's, the, we, the Greek doesn't have the word a or an, an indefinite article that just says, hey, a noun's around the corner, uh, like, uh, hey, uh, there's a university in Texas that's a good school, okay? That just means there's a university in Texas that's a good school. But when you use the word the in the English, it means there's a specific one. The university at Texas Tech in Lubbock. <laughs> then you've got something specific to be talking about. Okay? So it's, the Greek doesn't have the A, doesn't have that indefinite. But when they insert the word the... There are times where it's because they're talking about a very definite art noun. So here's what you have with, in the Greek. A righteousness from God apart from law. Not capitalized. Because there's no article there. Paul means any law. Apart from any idea of I work and so I get. I work and so I get. I deserve because I earned. Apart from any work of any kind of law you want to come up with. A righteousness apart from law has been made known to which the law. And there the Greek inserts the word the because the law there that's being talked about is the Torah. The Old Testament law of Moses. To which the law and the prophets testify. So there is a salvation apart from any type of I work to get it that is testified to by the Old Testament. And those are the kinds of things when you get down into the verses that you get to do. So, isn't this fun? The Bible's just worthy of great study. There's just like so much in there. I can't wait to tell you about next week. Last point for home. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. That is my goal. I pray it is yours as well. Would you pray with me? Lord, we come before you. Just, uh, I feel like I've been drinking from a fire hydrant, Lord. You got so much in your word that you have given us. So many blessings for us to discover and uncover and learn from. And I pray that you'll ignite within us a great hunger and desire. Just study more carefully, more devotedly, the, the, the revelation that you have made known to us through Words we can read, Bibles we can study, tools we can apply, fellowship and class and encouragement we can learn from each other. Put a hunger within us, Lord, that's satisfied by nothing less 
than feasting upon your word to us, ultimately Jesus Christ, through whom we pray. Amen. Amen.